Okay, friends, we're going to go ahead and get started. Thank you so much for joining us today and for being here at the beautiful Diamond Bar Library. Um, just a couple of little housekeeping items. I just wanted to let you know if for any reason you need to step out during the program, that's totally fine. Um, if you can just do so quietly, um, that would be great. There are restrooms um, in the, off the lobby. There's a big sign that says restroom, so if you need to use that, feel free to step out and come back in um, if you need to. All right, we're gonna go ahead and just let people trickle in through the back and I'm gonna kick things off, you ready? Okay. Hi everyone and welcome to our LA County Library program with author Dan Santat. Before I introduce Dan, I wanted to let you know that our summer discovery program has started this is our annual celebration of reading, learning, and curiosity for people of all ages. And we invite you, your family, your friends to sign up for this exciting program. For those joining us in person today, you can sign up after the program here at the Diamond Bar Library. Uh, for those of you joining us on the live stream, you can sign up online at lacountylibrary.org slash summer reading, or by visiting your nearest LA County Library location. It is my pleasure to introduce our fantastic presenter today. Dan Santat is the Caldecott Medal winning and New York Times bestselling author and illustrator of The Adventures of Beekle, The Unimaginary Friend, and The Road Trip Time Travel Adventure, Are We There Yet? His artwork is also featured in numerous picture books, chapter books, middle grade novels, including Dave Pilkey's Ricky Ricotta series. Dan lives in Southern California with his wife, two kids, and many, many pets. And without any further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Dan Santat. Thank you very much. My name is Dan Santat. I, it's a pleasure to be here. I came all the way from Pasadena, California. And, um, you know, I'm going to uh, talk to you today about the life, the glamorous life of children's publishing. Um, but... Uh, but first, I know you kids have graduated. Uh, you finished school, what, a week ago? So congratulations. Now you're one, one year closer to graduating and moving off to college. Um, and you probably have some summer reading that you probably have to do, or maybe you're, maybe you're not. Maybe you're bored and you have nothing else to do uh, because there's a writer's strike and you know we're not going to be able to watch some of our favorite shows. So while you kids might not be able to get to watch some of your shows, I'd like to I'd like to offer some 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 light reading for you if you're if you're so inclined. OK, so, um, you know, the first book I'd like to offer to you is my graphic novel, The Aquanaut. Um, I think there are some some parents in this audience who are of my age. And if you grew up in Los Angeles, maybe you remembered an old um, an old rusty aquatic uh, place that was like a SeaWorld knockoff known as Marineland out in Palos Verdes, California. Man, that place was shady. I don't think anybody realized that that Aqualand, that uh, Marineland was started by Hanna-Barbera, the animators. They just opened up that place so they could sell t-shirts with Scooby-Doo on it, right? Anyway, this is a wonderful story about four sea creatures that, that take an old diving suit and convert it into a land walking device so that they can explore the space uh, known as land, you know, absent of water. Um, and then they go on this adventure and they, and they get caught up in this adventure uh, in this sea world kind of place and they, and they have to escape. So that is, that is one. For those of you who uh, love to travel, uh, maybe you want to know a little bit more about me and my, and my love, my, my wonderful life of growing up. I grew up in Ventura County. I grew up in Camarillo, California. Uh, for those of you who are familiar with Camarillo, you probably know it as that place that has the big giant outlet mall. Okay. Now, when I was a kid growing up, I actually dated the girl who, who, whose family owned all that farmland. And let me tell you, she made off like a bandit. Uh, but I have this book that just came out in February. It's called The First Time for Everything. And it's about a very young 13-year-old Dan Santat who, who did not fare very well in junior high. He was constantly picked on uh, and made fun of because he was one of the few Asian kids in that town. Uh, and he went on a three-week trip to Europe and went on all kinds of adventures. Uh, so that is something that you might consider. Um, and then some upcoming titles. I'm just going to do a little name dropping here. Not on purpose. It's just this is the company that I keep. Um, for those of you who are looking forward to some of my further titles, I do have a book coming out in September um, by a certain celebrity by the name of Jake Gyllenhaal. 
Uh, and this book is called The Secret Society of Aunts and Uncles. And, and I and I kid you not, he just slid into my DMs on Instagram one day and said, hey, I'm a big fan. And uh, maybe maybe you've seen a little movie called Brokeback Mountain. Uh, maybe you'd like to illustrate my book. So I have this book coming out in September. Uh, and for those of you who are big fans of Barry or, or Happy Days, um, here was another, here's another fine chap by the name of Henry Winkler. And he wrote this book series called Detective Duck with our mutual friend Lynn Oliver. So this one's called Detective Duck, um, you know, and it's about it's about this duck and all his little friends, uh, you know, going on these little uh, adventures in their little pond in New Hampshire. Now, that's just some suggestions. Uh, you can you can read whatever you want, quite frankly, but I do think that's some of the finest reading of the summer. Now, on to the show. My wife has always told me never to talk to strangers, and here I am. I find myself in a spot where I'm speaking to a room of people I've never met before, and quite frankly, I find it a little terrifying. But I thought maybe it'd be best if we began by me reading you a little story, and I'd like your participation, you know, no, none, none of this hand-raising stuff, because we're out of school now, so if you want to participate, just feel free to shout it out uh, and, 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 and have some fun, okay, because it's a Saturday. Um, now, I'm going to read this book to you. It was written by my friend, Mr. Aaron Reynolds, as you can see here. Uh, and, and I'm going to show you how easy it is to write a book because this book only has one word. And that word for us Southern Californians is a very precious word. And that word is dude. And the beauty of that word is that by the way you say it, it can have many different meanings. Uh, you know, like, dude, happy Mother's Day. I just said that to my mom a couple weeks ago. Dude, happy Mother's Day. Uh, you know, dude, uh, go to school. I said that to my kids the other day. Now, without further ado, I'm going to read you dude, and then afterwards talk a little bit about my life as an author illustrator, uh, give you a drawing demonstration so I can show you how to draw anything in the universe using basic shapes, um, and then we'll go off into a Q&A. So here we go. <clears throat> dude, word by... Aaron Reynolds, who cares? He's not here, I'm here. And art by Dan Santat, yay! Thank you, I'm powered by your love. Uh, uh, um, dude. Dude, see we have this platypus here and he sees an ice cream stand and he's really excited, it's like ice cream. Dude, see the way you say it, he's excited, dude but we have a beaver, we have a beaver, and he sees these dangerous rocks on the other side. And he's a little concerned, he says, dude. Now, there are two surfers with two surfboards. What do surfers say? What do surfers say? Dude, yeah, they say it like that, dude. They say, dude! Right? And they go out, they go out into the ocean, and a beautiful pelican is flying overhead. I don't know if you've ever seen a pelican before. I mean, you guys are kind of far from the, from the beach, from the ocean, but oh, they're, they're adorable. They're adorable. Uh, you know, and it comes down with its big, big beak, and it scoops up a fish out of the water, and the, and the, and the beaver is very impressed. He says, dude! And, and the bird flies up in the air, and they're so impressed by its majestic beauty. <gasps> dude! Okay, we get it, right? We know how this book works. What do you think is the next word? You'd be wrong. The word is splat. Gosh, I thought you figured it out by now. Um, no, because the pelican pooped on his head. But what's a, good, what's a good reaction to that when something like that happens to you? Yeah, you go, dude! Just so upset it got pooped on his head. Oh, but, uh, oh, but wait, the beaver looks over his shoulder See something on the horizon, what do you think it is? Well, could it be a dolphin? No, you want that's because you want it to be a shark, right? Could it be a shark? He's not even sure. He says, dude? You think who who here thinks it's a shark? You're right, it is a shark. Dude! But look, look, look at the shark. The shark doesn't look very mean. He looks a little sad, and he, he expresses that. He says, dude, <laughs> dude. Here's a little fact. You know, we have Shark Week, and the sharks, they look really mean and vicious, and they're attacking, like, all kinds of animals in the ocean. They only do that for ratings. It's Shark Week. They have to get, they have to get as many, as many uh, 
as many viewers as possible. That's why they do it. They try to look mean. Dude, now we have this awkward moment. We have this awkward moment. We just hurt this. We hurt the shark's feelings. And they need to fix it. So the, the beaver comes up with an idea. He says, oh, dude. And he swims off. And he leaves the poor platypus with the shark. And he's just, he's just waiting patiently. What do you think? What do you think the beaver went to go get? Oh, oh, I heard, I heard the answer. Ice cream. Ah, ice cream. And this gives the platypus an idea. He says, oh, dude. And he swims off. And the shark's trying to eat ice cream for the first time. To this day, I drew this book. I gave the shark a tongue. I don't even know if sharks have tongues. That's, that's the extent of my research. And he's so polite. He offers the beaver some ice cream. Like, Would you like some ice cream? And the beaver says, no, thank you. I don't, I don't eat before I swim, right? And, and so he just continues on his way. What do you think the platypus is bringing back? He brought a surfboard. Oh. And the shark is just enamored. He's just like, I've always been in the water, but I've never been on top of the water. So now we have three surfers with three surfboards. What do three surfers say? They say, dude! Now, the shark wants to fit in with the others. So he decides to put on some board shorts, right? But he doesn't have legs. So he just fits his body into one of the legs and then the other leg just flails in the wind aimlessly. That's my job as an illustrator, to add the extra jokes in. Mr. Aaron Reynolds sends me a manuscript that says, dude, 17 times. And I go, let me, let me work on this, pal. All right? But, uh-oh. Remember those rocks? Uh! What do they do? They don't know, dude. Dude. Even the shark, dude. Whoop blammo! Oh my gosh, they're not very good at surfing. They crash into the rocks. Their bodies wash ashore, and they're holding their broken pieces of surfboard. Very disappointed. Dude, dude. But the shark, he has an idea. He says, oh, dude. And they swim back out into the ocean. And the beaver and the platypus are completely confused. They don't know what they're doing. And the shark just says, we're here. And the two are confused, dude. And then they turn around. They're going, uh-oh, what, what? Dude! They're using the shark as a surfboard. And the, platy and the platypus is on there, and the beaver's on there, and the, and the pelicans are, 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 are grading them. But the shark's not done. He's on land. He's like, dude's. What do you think the shark wants? What? Oh, you think he wants more ice cream? I think Ethan is right. I think he does want more ice cream. Dads! Everyone's terrified of this shark. Everyone's running for their lives. Shark just wants some ice cream. He just wants some love. But I guess that's that's how it is, right? And so, but they get all the ice cream. That's the good news. Dude, dude. Dude. Now, here's the funny thing, because we live out here in California. We face the Pacific Ocean. The sun sets over the Pacific Ocean. Oh, nice end of a nice day. We're just eating ice cream, you know, watching the sunset. But I have done this presentation in front of kids on the East Coast where you face the Atlantic and the sun rises over there. And so I've had kids ask me, Mr. Santat, did they stay there all night and wait for the sun to come up and then eat the ice cream? And I thought, oh, my gosh. I didn't even realize that till now because you're facing the Atlantic Ocean and the sun rises. And take that one step further, I went to do a school presentation in Hawaii and I was on the west side of the island and then I realized that the sun set on the west side and you go to the east side of the island and the sun rises. Mind blown, I'm on one island, two things are happening at once. Anyway, that's Dude, written by, who cares, but illustrated by Dan Santat. Yay! Thank you. I'm powered by your love. All right, now, little, little bit about me. I come from a magical land known as Los Angeles. That's how we locals pronounce it, right? Los Angeles. 
For those of you who are not bilingual, Los Angeles translates to the land of unemployed actors. That's what Los Angeles translates to. They like to call themselves part-time baristas, but we all know the truth, right? Now you're probably wondering, Mr. Santat, do you just sit, change your desk all day making books? No, I do other things. I have many hobbies. I love to cook. Here's a sample of a big loaf of sourdough bread that I made a while back. I'd like you to know that I was baking bread before it was trending and cool on social media. I like to consider myself a, 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 a you know, a, a trendsetter. Okay, but I do love to cook all kinds of dishes. Um, I'm always looking for a nice fried chicken recipe. So if anybody has any uh, recipes, I'm all ears. Um, I also like to roast my own coffee. Okay, now this is a this is a little thing that a friend of mine from Seattle got me into, uh, and and it was very simple. I got myself a roaster and some green beans. And let me tell you, folks, if if you if you ever get into this hobby the rest of your coffee tasting experiences will just go out the window. You're gonna to go to Starbucks, you're gonna to go to Pete's, and you realize it's all absolute swill, okay? But it's okay, I mean, I love having my nice cup of coffee in the morning. Uh, you know, I like trying different, different ways of making coffee. Um, I also like to make furniture. You know, sometimes I have like a wood shop in my basement. Uh, during the pandemic, I actually made a ukulele out of cardboard uh, that actually works. That was a lot of fun. Uh, love to travel. Okay, now this is one of the last big family trips that I took with my wife and two kids. We were in London. Uh, I was out there in 2019 doing research for this book. Um, and so we haven't really done a huge family international trip in a long time, but we are going to Japan in August, which I'm very excited about. We're going to hang out with a friend of ours uh, who you might know by the name of Dave Pilkey. Uh, Dave Pilkey actually lives out there, and he's been, he's been out there for the last four years. Uh, so it'll be nice to see him after many, many, many years of not seeing him. Uh, here's something that I thought I'd never have as a hobby. Running. Okay. If you ask young little Dan Santat if he would run 26.2 miles, uh, you know, he would say, not unless I'm being chased by a bear. But, but you know, Mr. Santat was sitting at his desk for many years making books, watching his butt get all fat because he was just sitting there, you know, eating snacks while making books. And he realized that he had to go outside and, and, and get a little bit of exercise. And then suddenly, you know, a two-mile jog turned into a four-mile jog, eight, 16, 26.2 miles. Yeah, here I am, 2019, crossing the finish line of the LA Marathon. Yes, thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, thank you. Now, there's many other things you could do with four and a half hours of your day. You could watch Avengers Endgame once with a couple bathroom breaks. But, you know... This was really fantastic because there's something really magical about running down Sunset Boulevard and realizing like, oh, like this is something only cars get to do. It's pretty amazing. Uh, but one of my oldest, most favorite hobbies was to draw. Here's a picture of Garfield and Odie that I drew uh, in crayon when I was six years old. Okay, well, thank you, thank you. Now, I want you guys to all know something, okay? When I was a kid, there was this kid that I grew up with. His name was Jason Watanabe, and he was kind of a punk. And every time I drew something, he would just look at my drawing and say, that's not very good, Mr. Santa. That's not very good, Dan. And, you know, there was that Asian side of me that said, I'll show you, Jason Watanabe. And I just kept practicing and working hard, and I drew this. And guess what? Jason Watanabe didn't think it was very good. But I knew it was good because all the other kids, if you have this ability to draw, they're like, oh, my gosh, this guy knows magic. Now draw me a puppy. Every kid always wants a puppy. I don't know why. Anyway, I fell in love with drawing. And let me tell you something, kids. I bet anybody in this room that wanted to draw this picture of Garfield and Odie, I bet you could do it because it all just takes a lot of practice. Okay? I've seen people who couldn't draw a stick figure suddenly draw superheroes and things like that. Believe me, I witnessed it. Now, I'd like you all to believe that, that it's a talent, that like only a few people can do it. But the truth is... It's like riding a bicycle, okay? Now, if you remember being a kid learning how to ride a bicycle, you weren't just naturally gifted, right? You didn't just hop on the bike as a baby and like start popping wheelies and jumping off curbs, right? It's something you had to practice. You had to practice with training wheels and learn to balance on the wheels with pedaling, and then you eventually took the training wheels off and then you could pedal around, right? Same thing with drawing. The more you do it, the better you get. Um, another example would be uh, your alphabet. Right? When you were learning your letters, maybe your letters were all weird and craggly, but then over some time, you know, you got some really nice handwriting. You're starting spelling out some words. Same thing with drawing. It's all just a muscle memory. And as I got older, you know, now that I had these parents, I had, surprise, surprise, I had these Asian parents that wanted me to grow up and be a doctor. 
So they never let me take art classes when I was a kid, but I had this lovely school librarian that said, Mr. Santat, now I understand that your parents won't let you take art classes, but that doesn't mean you can't check out books to teach yourself how to draw. And she gave me this book called How to Draw Comics the Marvel Way, and I checked it out every week, and I taught myself how to draw, and I came back to Jason Watanabe, and I said, look at these skills, man. You know. So here's a picture. I used to have this, I used to have this tradition where I would sit in front of my favorite TV show Friday night, 8 p.m. with a piece of paper, a comic book cover that I wanted to copy, and I usually draw something in that one hour of time uh, to something that, that I was really pleased with. This was a cover of The Incredible Hulk drawn by one of my old favorite car artists by the name of Todd McFarlane. This took me three hours. I'd never spent that much time on a drawing ever in my life. And typically, Friday night, 8 p.m., I would sit in front of my favorite TV show, which was The Dukes of Hazard. Okay, and I would sit there and I'd draw for an hour and I wasn't even anywhere near done for that first hour. Dukes of Hazard was done and my mom came in because nine o'clock was her favorite show, which was Dallas. And for a second hour, I'm still drawing this picture of the Incredible Hulk while my mom's sitting there watching the antics of Ewing Oil. And then 10 o'clock came around and I still wasn't done, but I was really progressing really well. And this third show came on that I'd never seen before called Falcon Crest. Now, for those of you who aren't familiar, Falcon Crest was like Dallas, but it took place on a winery. And so I'm drawing this picture of the Hulk. Three hours go by. The dust settles. I blow the pencil shavings aside, and lo and behold, I drew this picture of the Incredible Hulk to the best of my ability. And I was so proud of myself that day because on that day, I learned two things. One, I can draw anything I want if I sit down and concentrate and work hard enough. And two, I absolutely love Falcon Crest. It's such a good show. <laughs> I hope, I hope Paramount Plus just adds all those seasons. I would just binge it for, for weeks on end. Now, I've done over 120 books for kids. I've worked with some of your favorites, like Dave Pilkey and Mo Willems. Uh, I am best known for this book, The Adventures of Beagle, The Unimaginary Friend. Yay! The Adventures of Beagle, The Unimaginary Friend, which unfortunately won the Randolph Caldecott Medal in 2015. Now, you're probably saying, Mr. Santa. Why would you say that? Like, that's a lovely honor to have. Like, why would you say that's such an unfortunate thing? Well, let me tell you why, all right? Now, I worked very hard on this cover, and once the book won this prestigious gold medal, it gets a shiny gold sticker, you know, plastered on it for every future printing for the rest of eternity so everyone knows it won this major award. And you know, I worked very hard on this painting, and you know where that sticker goes? It goes over this man's legs right over here, right? Now, I want you to look at those legs and I want you to stare at them long and hard because you're never gonna see those legs ever again. <laughs> and, and I worked hard on that and that's probably my favorite part of the painting, okay? Now, you're gonna have a day where you're in the library with your friend Kevin or Paula, you know, and they're gonna say, this is a lovely cover by Mr. Santat, but I wonder what's underneath that sticker. And you can say, oh, I know. They're a pair of legs, and you know what? They're glorious. But you'll never see them ever again because it's covered by this annoying gold sticker. And that's the burden that I have to live with for the rest of my life, but I do it for all of you, okay? Now, let's take a good look at this Caldecott medal. We're very familiar with the front of the Caldecott medal. It's got this, it's got this etching of a man on a horse recklessly and dangerously just stampeding through ducks and children. I don't know what he's in a hurry about. It looks like a, a really twisted episode of Squid Game or something like that. But I bet you've never seen the back of a Caldecott medal, all right? Here's the back of a Caldecott medal. And it's got this cool, it's got this cool etching of a guy who looks like he's playing air guitar, you know, with doves flying by, like he's in an old heavy metal video, right, from the 80s. And then there's all this writing around it. There's all this writing around it. I've had this medal for about eight years, and not for one second have I taken any time to read what it says. I think it says, if lost, please return to Dan Santat in Los Angeles, California. I think that's what it says. It says Dan Santat in the year I won it, in 2015. And that is the back of a Caldecott medal. So let's talk a little bit about how I write a book. Let's talk about how the magic is made, okay? Uh, you know, I think in your mind, you probably think Mr. Santat's wearing a nice little cardigan, you know, next to a rolling fireplace, sitting in front of a typewriter, writing beautiful sentences. Well, uh, that couldn't be further from the truth. Typically, I like to put on my Lululemon pants, and kids, let me tell you something. Uh, if you've never had Lululemon pants on your skin, oh, you never want to go back. That cotton is amazing. All right. 
I put on my Lululemon pants. I throw my dogs and two cats outside. And while my kids and my wife are off to work and school, and I, and I, and I open up a notebook. And I just, I just start writing down ideas. I'm not even writing whole sentences. I just think of ideas that I've seen that have inspired me from everywhere. You know, and I just throw them all down on a piece of paper. Maybe it's something I saw in a video game. Maybe it's something I saw on a TV show. Uh, you know, maybe it's a song lyric or, or, or whatever. But I just get ideas from wherever, newspapers, magazines, just hearing conversations in the park. And I just throw them all down on a piece of paper, almost like if you were to take a puzzle and you dump all the puzzle pieces out and on a table. Like, those are just ideas. And then you just take these little separate pieces of ideas and you try to connect them and try to make a picture or you try to make a story. That's the best way I come up with ideas. That's the best way I can describe it. And this process could take months, sometimes even years. But once I get an idea for a story and I work it out in my head a little bit, then I'll write a manuscript draft. Picture books are about 1,200, 1200 words. T picture books are typically 32 to 40 pages long. Uh, I will send I will send a, a document to my editor who lives out in New York, and we just go back and forth, and we work on this story. And then once that's done, I do what's known as a thumbnailing stage. Now, this is a very important stage. Uh, the best way to describe thumbnailing, it's like if, if you uh, were to build a house, but before you build a house, you're going to make blueprints for that house before you saw any wood or hammer any nails. You want to you wanna plan ahead. You want to know how many doors there are. You want to know how many windows there are in a place. And so that's basically what thumbnailing a book is, is for. You, you lay out all 32 pages, and you figure out the pacing, what illustrations are going to go with what words in the text. And, and that way you can figure out all the mistakes uh, before you actually execute and do the final art. It saves you hours and months and weeks of time. So once I do this, this can take me about maybe a week or two weeks, but once I figure out this step, then, then I get to make the artwork. And, and this is really great, right? So I sit in my studio, and, and I have an iMac computer. You probably have an iMac computer at home. And I use this very powerful software program called Adobe Photoshop, which is an industry standard these days. A lot of, a lot of artists used to use uh, Photoshop. And then down here... I have, this, I have this device known as a Wacom tablet or a Cintiq, uh, which is a, basically a digital drawing pad. If I were to show it to you here, it's basically a digital drawing pad that you plug into the back of your computer and you've got this digital pen. And whatever you draw on the surface shows up on the computer screen. The other side works like an eraser. It's like painting, but on a very expensive uh, digital tablet. Now, the great thing about working on a computer is that I can do a lot of things in, in very... Uh, you know, very efficient amount of time. You know, a painting that typically would take me weeks, I can get done in a day. Um, very powerful thing. I can do things on a computer that I can't typically do with paintbrushes and paint. For example, let's take the Crate and Barrel catalog, okay? Now, we've got this new 4-in-1 Weber Grill system. We've got this, you know, fine young looking millennial here. He looks like he's from Southern California, so he's probably grilling quinoa burgers because we, we, you know, we Angelinos know that there's only three things we Southern Californians eat. We only eat avocado toast, sushi, and quinoa burgers. The rest are all just empty calories. Now, I'm a busy man. I don't have time to get into my Prius because that's all we drive. We're all just going around in silver Priuses and Teslas. I don't have time to get into my Prius, drive down to a crate and barrel, find this new four-in-one Weber grill system, and pretend that I'm flipping quinoa burgers? No. But with the power of a computer, check this out, Alakazam, whew, I can Photoshop myself into the Crate and Barrel catalog pretending that I'm enjoying a nice, fine quinoa burger with this fine, young-looking millennial. But wait, look closely. He's not actually cooking anything. He's an actor. He's one of those unemployed actors from Los Angeles. The joke's on me. Here's another example from the Crate and Barrel catalog. We've got this fine dining set. Again, I'm a busy man. I don't have time to get into my Prius and drive down to a Crate and Barrel and pretend that I'm sitting down at this nice dining set and eating a quinoa burger with a, gar a side of garlic aioli. No, but with the power of a computer, check this out. Whew. I can Photoshop myself into that kitchen, picking up an orange out of the orange bowl. All I had to do was take a picture of myself holding an orange, and then I took that photo, laid it on top of this photo, and then just erased the parts of my body to give the illusion that I'm standing behind the tables and chairs. Kids, this joke only took 15 minutes to make. 
but it gets to live in your minds for the rest of your lives. You're welcome. Now, here's an actual book cover that I had to work on for a, for a publisher. The beautiful part about this job is that I get to read manuscripts a year before the rest of you do. So sometimes I can say, that's a good one. You don't want to read that one. That's terrible. But I get to read this manuscript. I do this sketch. All done on computer. Not one single tree was harmed in the making of this book. And I, and I made this I made this sketch in a couple hours, sent it off to my, to my art director, and she said, yeah, this is lovely. Go ahead and color it. And I'm going to show you the process right now. Okay, you lay in the pieces. It's like it's like I get to make a coloring book, and then I get to I get to color the coloring book, and I get to 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 be paid for that. And and with that money, I I buy more Lululemon pants. So here we are. We've blocked in the colors, but now I render. See, I'm adding sh you know shadows and highlights. I'm making textures. I want the dragon skin to feel scaly, and then want the eyeball to look round and shiny. And I just go around the entire illustration and I render. I render the muscles. I render the wings on the dragon's back. You know, I'm rendering the trash. I'm creating mood lighting. I'm adding highlights. I'm adding steam coming out of the dragon's nostrils because he breathes fire. And, and voila, here you have a finished piece. If I were to paint this with paintbrushes and paint, probably would have taken me three to four days but because I did it on a computer, it took me one day. And, and kids, here's, here's the lovely thing about, about being a parent, is that when your kids are at school, you get to go up to their room and play with their toys and they can't stop you. And that's what I did with those three extra days. I said, daddy loves Legos. You know, I'm, I'm playing, or maybe I'm, maybe I'm gonna make something in your Minecraft, you know, account. And so that's, that's, that's the process of making artwork. And now I'm gonna step over here. And with this pen and this nice easel here, I'm going to show you a quick demonstration on how to draw anything, thing, thing in the universe, verse, verse, using basic shapes and letters of the alphabet. All right, now, first thing I need you all to understand is that drawing is not very hard. It's about taking your basic shapes and then adding to it to make more complex objects. All right, now, when you draw, I want you to keep in mind that everything is a symbol. For example, what's a symbol, Mr. Santat? Well, if I took this shape here, what would you say that shape is? It's a cloud, right? Now, if I go outside, I look at the clouds. Do the clouds look exactly like this? The answer is no, because this is a symbol of a cloud, all right? Now, if I were to describe a cloud, I would say it's, Big, white, fluffy up in the sky, right? Big, white, fluffy. But the word illustrate in Latin translates to make light or to communicate an idea. Egyptians, ancient Egyptians, they had, they had their own alphabet known as hieroglyphics, which were all pictures and symbols. That was how they communicated ideas. And if I want to take a symbol, but I want to communicate an idea, but I need to clarify it, then you would just add more information. So if I were to take this shape and I were to add more information, I could clarify that this is a cloud in the sky simply by adding little lines on the bottom of it because we know, we understand that clouds rain and this is now a rain cloud, correct? And that's just, that's just by combining simple shapes and combining them together to communicate new ideas. I can take, I can take this basic shape here and I can communicate many other things. Look, I can take this shape here, right? And then look, I made popcorn, yay, thank you very much. Or, or I could take this shape here and instead of lines, what if I just added a thin little rectangle on the bottom, right? And now we've drawn ourselves a tree. Because in our minds, we understand how to communicate a tree. It's a big bushy head of leaves on the top with a thin tree trunk on the bottom described by a rectangle. And that communicates tree just by using two simple shapes that I know anybody in this room can do, all right? Now, little details make all the difference, all right? What if I were to substitute that rectangle with a different shape? What if I took this rectangle, what if I took this cloud shape and instead of a rectangle, I drew a triangle instead, okay? Now, this has become 
cotton candy, right? And we could even add a couple more de details. I could add the diagonal lines here because it's, it's the paper that's wrapped around the cone. Little details make all the difference. Now, letters of the alphabet are also symbols, okay? And if you look at letters a certain way, you can use them for drawing tools. Now I could take, I could take this cloud shape yet again, okay? And now I can combine it with letters of the alphabet. I'll even keep track of the letters of the alphabet. I'll use the letter U, right? I'll take that letter U, I'll turn it sideways, and now I've got a little head, all right? I can use the letter O. The letter O can give me a little eyeball right there, see? And then I could use the letter L, and the letter L can make these tiny little legs, right? And now I have drawn a sheep using a cloud shape, the letter U, the letter O, and the letter L. It's just a matter of seeing things and using them as tools. Now, we're gonna take this to a whole other level because now I'm gonna show you that you can use letters of the alphabet to draw a face. Okay, now when we want to talk about a face, we understand that there are certain rules to identify a face. You have a head, you have two eyes, a nose, a mouth, ears, eyebrows, maybe some hair. I think hair is a little overrated, quite frankly. I was not given the choice, but those are the parameters that I have to live with. Now, if I were to draw, if I were to draw a face, I will use the letter O for a head. Okay, so the letter O. The letter O makes a nice shape for a head. Now, we're not done yet because we haven't added the, all, all the other details. So far, I have made you a Pringle. I have made you a hole. I have made you a slice of bologna. I have made you, I have made you a potato. I have made you a rock. I need to add some eyes. So I'm gonna use the letter O again to make some eyes, okay? And we know where those eyes go because we understand what a face looks like. I'm gonna add two circles here Two little eyes, right? Now it looks like a Korean face mask. It looks like it looks like an unfinished bowling ball. It looks like a hockey mask. So we'll add some pupils because it's a little terrifying. So I'm going to add some eyes right there. Another letter, a couple O's. And now, now someone's wearing the Korean face mask, <laughs> trying to trying to purify that skin. All right. We've got, we've got a terrified potato, okay? Now, let's incorporate another letter. Uh, let's, let's take the letter L, okay? Now, by itself, by itself, the letter L is just a lovely letter that can spell words like laughter and love, but if I place that L somewhere on this face, you're gonna see it magically transform into something else. Ooh, I can't wait. All right, watch this. I'm gonna take that letter L and I'm gonna put it right in the middle right there, and now suddenly that letter L is a nose. That's what I mean, kids. You take symbols and you use them the right way and they can be something else. That's the beauty of drawing, okay? It's not about how well you draw, it's about how well you see, all right? C, C is a very wonderful, versatile letter. The thing about these, the thing about these letters is that you can use them in many ways, right? I could take that letter C and I could put one right here and now, I've made an ear. I can take that letter C, I can turn it to the other side, and now I've got two ears, yay. I can turn that letter C, I can turn it on its side, and now we've got ourselves a little smile. I can take that letter C, I can turn it upside down, and now look, I've got two eyebrows. Oh no, now look at that, kids. You just drew yourself Bruce Willis. Good for you, you drew Bruce Willis. Oh look, you just drew TV star Michael Chiklis. You drew 1980s pop star Sinead O'Connor. Kids, you just drew Dwayne Johnson, you drew The Rock. And he's so happy because you just found out what he's cooking, okay? Now, little details make all the difference. What if we took our pal Dwayne Johnson, AKA The Rock, and we gave him some glasses? What if we gave him some glasses? And that's just simple circles over each eye, and then, and then the letter U to bridge the nose. Oh my gosh, where did Dwayne Johnson go? I have no idea. I, I, I don't know, because all I see is dreamy movie star and, and amazing Italian chef Stanley Tucci. 
from CNN searching for Italy. He's so dreamy. He's so dreamy. And he's, he's really the model icon for all bald men, I, I admit. Okay, so now, or yeah, so that's, that's Stanley Tucci. But little details make all the difference. So what if we took our pal, Mr. Stanley Tucci here, and we gave him some thicker eyebrows? Okay, what if, what if suddenly Stanley Tucci just woke up one morning and he was blessed by these big giant caterpillars sleeping on his forehead? No, oh, where did Stanley Tucci go? I have no idea because all I see is award-winning author, illustrator, Mr. Dan Santat. Yay! Now, the sad part is that this is a very accurate depiction of me just using basic letters of the alphabet. You're not going to get this mixed up with some of the more dreamy authors like, like Mo Willems or, 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 you know, or Oliver Jeffers and his dreamy Irish accent or, or Sophie Blackhall. But just, just keep in mind that I'm just some thick eyebrows away from looking exactly like Stanley Tucci. Okay, that's, and then now suddenly I'm the rock. That's how it works. Okay, so that, that concludes my presentation. Please feel free to go home, teach yourself how to draw. Uh, have a fun summer, kids. I hope it doesn't get too hot. Uh, and now we'll open the floor up for some questions. Thank you so much. Let's give Thank Dan you. a big round of applause. Curtsy. Curtsy. So he is generously offered or has generously offered to answer some questions if anyone has any that they would like to ask. Um, and maybe while you're thinking about any questions you might have for Dan, I'm going to start with, with one. Yes. So you're both an author and an illustrator. Yes. Which do you like better? I thought, so I went to the Art Center College Design in Pasadena and there I learned how to illustrate. And while I was learning how to be an illustrator, I, I learned that I actually love to write more than I like to draw. And so now I like to consider myself a storyteller that just happens to draw. So, yes. I love that. Um, does anyone have any questions for Dan? If not, I'm going to keep asking mine. But I think you might have better ones. So who inspired me? So it's a funny story because I went to UC San Diego. I got a degree in biology that I don't use. And it was my, all my college roommates that, that witnessed this. I said, what are you doing? You know, he said, are you, you're, not, you're not really going to do a life of biology. You hate biology. But they knew that I love to draw. And they said, why don't you see if you can get into art school? Just, you know, just for fun. And I said, yeah, that's a good idea because I want to see if I'm good enough to get into art school. And I made a portfolio. I went all over San Diego finding figure drawing workshops. Didn't tell my parents. Okay. I know we're all laughing. We're like, yeah, that would be trouble. Now, I applied, got in, graduation day. My girlfriend, now wife, was sitting with me at dinner. She, I was clutching her hands with my sweaty hands. And my dad said, oh, oh, congratulations on your biology degree. And I said, dad, I got into art school. And it was like that scene in a movie where the record player scratches. It's like, Ur! and he just looks, and you could see him stop cutting his meat. He looks, and, I, and, I, and before he could interrupt me, I said, and I'm going to go whether you like it or not. And I thought he was going to kill me, but he took a nice, long, deep breath for about eight seconds, and he said, well, I just want you to be happy. And so that was, I really owe it to my friends who saw the passion and, and, and the ability and, and the potential. And they were the ones that kind of just pushed me off and said, no, no, <laughs> look, if you're going to be a dentist, you're going to be a terrible dentist. Like you're going to hurt people. So they pushed me off in the direction of art and I haven't looked back since. I love that. Um, any other questions? Okay. I'm going to ask another one of mine All right. since I All get right. to, um, <clears throat> do you have a favorite book? So I think a lot of people think that Beekle is my favorite book because it's that shiny gold sticker on there. But the truth is my favorite book is After the Fall, which is a love letter to my darling wife. Okay. And so the thing about that story, it's about anxiety and depression and getting over, you know, certain, you know, triggers and fears in your life. And in this particular case, Humpty Dumpty was overcoming his fear of heights. Uh, and so it's a metaphor about my wife overcoming some of her obstacles. Uh, and so as a result, I made this book. 
uh, and, and she's so deeply touched by it. In the end, Humpty Dumpty turns into a bird, right? Because he's an egg. Uh, and, and my wife was so deeply touched by this. She got a tattoo of a bird feather on her back, you know, which I thought was very touching. And I got a tattoo of a bird feather on my arm, see? And, and, so, and so the rules are now that we have to be married together forever. That's how, that's how marriage works. Matching tattoos, true love. Yes. Oh, God. <laughs> okay. Um, what advice do you have for kids who are interested in becoming authors and or illustrators? Uh, do not underestimate fan art and, you know, and uh, fan fiction. You know, it's a great way to just get the mileage out, practice, try to imitate. That's based, let me save you $120,000 in art school, okay? Just copy things from people that you like and then go out there and do that. That's, that's really, you, you practice by imitation, but then once you feel confident about your writing abilities or your drawing abilities, then you draw your own stuff without trying to imitate those people. You try to draw your own things. That's the hardest step of it all is trying to find your own voice, you know, but it's, it, there's this funny, there's this funny phrase in art school. They say, come here and learn stuff. But when you graduate, forget everything you learned. That's literally a thing that they say. And so that really does, that does summarize art school in a nutshell. <laughs> yes. Yes. I find inspiration in my family, uh, family and, and relationships. So uh, if I were to take, if I were to take Beekle, uh, Beekle is a, a metaphor about the day my son was born, about being a, you know, a parent waiting to meet this person for the first time, uh, not knowing what to expect, but when you finally meet them, you find out that they're the perfect fit. Uh, Beekle is also my son's very first word. Uh, it was his, it was his attempt at saying bicycle. And so we thought it'd be great that the name Beekle was his character's name. Uh, books like, are we there yet? So I have a younger son because you can't write a book for just one of your two kids or else you're gonna give them a horrible complex. So are we there yet is about my younger son who was so impatient, he just wanted to grow up and be like his brother. Uh, so, so are we there yet is, is an experience about um, your perception of time and enjoying the moment. Uh, after the fall is about my wife. Uh, Aquanaut is um, the Aquanaut is uh, for my father. Um, you know, it's about the passing of my father, uh, who died two years ago, um, and it's 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 a way of kind of dealing with loss. Uh, and then my most recent book, my most recent book, uh, Are We There Yet? I mean, not Are We There Yet? A first time for everything uh, <laughs> is a love letter to myself. Uh, you know, and that thirteen year old Dan that had a rough time in Ventura County trying to trying to grow up. And so, yeah, a lot of inspiration just comes from family and friends um, and just how to, how to tell those stories uh, from just years and years of, of ideas that you've imbibed from like pop culture, video games, and just telling it in an in a, in a entertaining way. That's a great question. Are there any other questions? There's one in the back. Yes. Yeah, yes. Oh, sure. I think there's a balance in both of those things. Yeah. Um, you know, like I have, I have a friend, I have a friend, he, he works for a financial firm out in New York, but at night, you know, he goes out to, to clubs and he, and he performs in a band. Like that's his way, his outlet of expression creatively, right? There's a good balance that you can have. Cause I mean, honestly, let's be honest, like not everybody can make a profession as an artist. It's a very, it's a very tough thing. You know, even my kids, they kind of entertain that idea of maybe I want to be an artist. I said, Oh, you sure you don't want to be a doctor? Like that word was coming out of my mouth. Right. But I just understand how hard it is to make a living. I'm just like, look, not everybody's working with folks like Mo Willems and Dave Pilkey, but I love you, you know? But maybe you want to get a nine to five job. I don't know, I'm just saying, get some Lululemon pants, right? But um, yes, no, there, there, is, there is that ability. My, my wife works in a, my wife works at Caltech. She is a scientist. She, she does important cell research, but, but on the side, she sure loves to, to garden and plant and, and do all these other cool things 
you know? So it's always nice to have a side hustle. Let me tell you something, you know, like my father devoted his entire life to work. And then when he retired, he had no hobbies, didn't know what to do with himself. Like retirement was the worst thing, you know, cause his life was work. And so everyone, everyone has to have a hobby. Everyone, you know, that's the purpose of living, you know, to have something else that you're passionate about. You don't have to make money from it, but have something that you're passionate about. That's not, not your, not your job. You know, because there's more to life than just work. I My like life just happens to be work and play. So, <laughs> yay me. <laughs> Best of both worlds. Well, thank you so much, Dan, thank you. for answering our questions and for sharing with us today. Um, let's give Dan one last round of applause. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Diamond Bar. Thank you, everyone, for being with us today. Um, Dan has graciously agreed to sign some books. So um, if you have a book that you would like him to sign, he will be at the table in the back. Um, before you get up, let's give him a minute to get back there. Um, and just a reminder that our summer discovery program has now launched. So please stop by the library and sign up before you leave today. Thank you all for coming. Have a wonderful Saturday.